For the first time in 27 years, the government has revamped its unemployment survey of households in a number of ways. Oh, my goodness, it failed. Try it again. Joanne Byrne's job is collecting the data. The first change is that this month, she'll be doing it by computer. I try it again. Now, new technology can be frustrating, at least at first, but it should help come up with a more accurate unemployment number, according to the person responsible for interpreting the data, Jack Breger. It introduces precision. There's, you have to ask the correct questions in the correct order with the computer, uh, because you'll plug in an answer and then it automatically gives you the next one. As a result, we were able to put together a much more uh, accurate and comprehensive questionnaire. The so-called household survey of unemployment began in 1940 and has been done pretty much the same way for decades. The Census Bureau sent us footage to illustrate its basic approach, surveying households with a lengthy written form. It now does 60,000 a month. What were you doing most of last week? Were you working on a job or something else? I was working. Confidentiality is guaranteed, so this, in case you're wondering, is a reenactment. We worked 40 hours. Over the years, the Bureau has incorporated computers into its tallying system. The old punch cards are being processed here. But starting January, the interviewing was done on computer, just like in this PR tape. Uh, she works for the uh, CIA. This is a somewhat clandestine operation. Confidentiality means that we can't watch the actual interviews. But our surveyor, Joanne Burns, agreed to take us around her survey area, Newark, New Jersey, to see how the nation's monthly unemployment data get collected. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> there are plenty of surprises on this job, and weather is usually the least of them. In surveying Newark neighborhoods for six years, Burns has faced police interrogation, physical threats, had doors slammed in her face. But Burns has some surprises of her own. Sometimes when you have a difficult person who turns you, you know, turns you away the first time or so, send them a card. <laughs> when you go back the next time, and you say, oh, did you get my card? Oh, was that you? I said, yes, that was me. Oh, come in. Beautiful card. You know, and you got them. You go in and you do the interview. Burns is one of 1,800 government employees who have only one week a month to track down and survey some 35 households. For the sample to be statistically valid, every interview counts. But getting even one household can eat up an entire day for a variety of reasons. So sometimes we have uh, what is called a language barrier. <laughs> you know, we cannot yeah. speak the, you know, we cannot speak their language and uh, they cannot speak our language. Yeah, yeah. When Burns used to survey in this Polish and now also Portuguese neighborhood, the locals had trouble with English and anyone asking questions in it. Burns had to reassure interviewees. Uh -huh. We weren't really trying to invade their privacy or anything, or uh, we weren't from the KGB or whatever, <laughs> you know, because you find that a lot of Polish people were very, you know, they were very leery of government. She turned to the priest of St. Casimir's for help, but today the parish house is snowed under. So, so what do you do in a situation like this? Say you were actually going to try to find them. Okay, we would, we would go around to the front and see if there's someone, you know, around there. Or we would ask around in the neighborhood to see if maybe the, uh, the priest was away or something. Uh -huh. And if there isn't anyone here, yeah, uh, what do you do? <laughs> we know what evening their services are. <laughs> you have to sit through the whole well, uh, mass or something? Well, what you would do is you would time it toward the end of the service. <laughs> but no services today. Uh, a lot. So if Burns were actually on the job today, she'd cross the street for a visit to the Polish hair salon. I'm Joanne Burns. I'm with the United States Census Bureau. And we just need a little information about the church. And what is the father's name now? Uh, my father's uh -huh. name? Jackson, not the <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. Martin? No, Martin. Martinez. Father no, Martinez. Mar not Martinez. Okay. Martinez. Yeah. Martinez. Yes. Father okay. Felix. Okay. Father, Father Felix. Felix. Okay. Very good. Do you want the phone number to call the office? Then? That would be good. That would okay. be good if I might have that number. Okay. Now this wasn't just for the camera. Burns will pass on the phone number to the person who currently surveys this neighborhood. Efforts like these and the work of some 350 phone interviewers result in a response rate of about 95%. The responses become the unemployment number reported the first Friday of every month.
How many hours per week does she usually work at her job? Now, even when the delivery is a little more authentic, the survey is only as good as the questions being asked. In January, interviewers were armed with new questions as well as the new computers. Here are the results from the old survey in December. Of all Americans 16 and over, 128.9 million were categorized as in the labor force, that is, either working or actively looking for work. Of those, 120.7 million were employed, 8.2 million unemployed, which means not working but trying to find a job. That's an unemployment rate of 6.4 percent. But as Burns and others were out braving ice, earthquakes and the like the third week of last month, Jack Breger was already anticipating a seemingly dramatic result. A higher unemployment number due solely to the new survey changes. It would appear that on average the unemployment rate will be about half of a percentage point higher. So in other words, uh, the December figure was 6.4 percent. All, all things being equal, it would be around 6.9 percent. That's largely because of the change in the questions. The old survey began, what were you doing most of last week? Working, keeping house, going to school, or something else? It didn't exactly focus the mind on the issue of work. After all, people spend more time sleeping in a week than do anything else in the first place. And so I, I, we didn't think that the initial question was giving the notion that this was a survey about labor force activity. The new survey, however, begins, last week, did you do any work for pay? It then continues with some new questions emphasizing work, such as, do you currently want a job, either full or part-time? The result is we're finding more people who are looking for work, particularly those groups that, that might be looking for part-time jobs. And this includes women, includes older persons, and includes teenagers. Now, back in December, another 65.5 million Americans were categorized as not in the labor force, that is, not looking for work at all. But as of January, some of those folks are now being recategorized as looking for work and therefore officially unemployed. Thus, the not in the labor force number goes down, the number of unemployed goes up, and the official unemployment rate this month is higher than it would have been using the old survey. <laughs> Joanne Burns expected to find some of the recategorized unemployed in buildings like this one, where she's interviewed in the past. Okay, this. Um, it's an apartment with no doorbells on the outside. No doorbells, but important data. People who, when asked directly, may now say they're looking for part-time work. But again, if you can't get in the door, you can't ask the question. I'm, I'm locked out. You're locked out? Mm hmm There are how many uh, apartments here? Uh, I would say approximately 30 or so. You have to go inside? Mm hmm So what do you do? I'll come and I'll sit and I'll wait until someone either comes out of the building or goes into the building. Sit, you mean on the... No, I'll sit the... on my car. Oh, you sit in your car. <laughs> yeah, I'll sit on the, on the hood of the car, and I'll wait there. And when I see someone coming up the sidewalk, then I'll follow them up, uh -huh. and I'll get access to the building. Or I'll wait until the mailman comes, and I'll come in with the mailman. Equipped with a new survey, data collectors were putting the more direct questions to occupants of buildings like this across the country. If the occupants were looking for part-time work, they'll now show up in the unemployment number. We continued our tour of Newark, talking about other, less significant changes in the survey, other problems in getting it done. But the main unemployment news this month is that the official unemployment rate went up, a hefty 0.3% in January for, as we've seen, purely technical reasons. Meanwhile, however, statistics aside, Joanne Burns is sensing an upswing in employment. Well, I see it from the people that I interview uh, that things are getting better. More people seem to be working. Uh, more people seem to be working more hours than they were in the past few years. I can also see it in my own household with my husband. Uh, he works at Ford Motors. Uh, a couple of years ago, and even up until last year, they were off a lot. They had a lot of downtime, but now they're working 10 hours a day, sometimes six days a week. In fact, especially for people with jobs, the situation is getting better. There are, however, more than 15 million Americans who are still either unemployed or part-time but looking for full-time, or who've given up looking for work altogether. Those people, of course, do show up in Joanne Burns' data, but one final sobering fact never makes it into the unemployment number at all. That there are now fewer job openings out there for each person looking 
than at any time in recent years.